I'm told that they are on their way. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good evening again. I request you to stand and to welcome the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa and the Vice Chancellor, and to remain standing as an ensemble from arts, culture, and heritage leads us in singing the national anthem. Let us 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, honored dignitaries and esteemed guests, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the prestigious Griffiths and Victoria Matenge Memorial Lecture, which tonight is entitled, The Role and Significance of a Strong Judiciary in South Africa's constitutional democracy and is appropriately delivered tonight by the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, C.J. Ray Zondo. We are gathered here this evening to commemorate the lives and legacies of Griffiths and Victoria McClenge, two extraordinary individuals who dedicated themselves to the pursuit of justice, transformation, and equality. My name is Professor Joanna Buerta from the Faculty of Law, and I am honored to be your program director. We are also privileged to have with us this evening the Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Sibongile Mutwa, a visionary leader whose guidance and stewardship has and continues to shape us into a dynamic African university, generating cutting edge knowledge for a sustainable future. I now invite the vice chancellor to ascend the stage and to share a few words with us, vice chancellor. Thank you, Program Director, Professor Johanna Porter. I want to recognize this evening our Chancellor, Dr. Geraldine Fraser Muleketi, our Chair of Council, Ambassador Nozipo January Badil, and all the members of our Governing Council that are participating in this august event this evening. I want to recognize our Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. Uh, I would like to recognize the family members of our two important families that we are celebrating this evening. Miss Pumzile Gumbi, who is the Chief Justice Langa's first daughter, and uh, Mrs. Sandile Langa, Chief Justice Langa's son, Miss Pindile Langa, uh, Justice Langa's daughter, Ms. Taba Ndovu, Justice Langa's niece. I would also want to recognize Dr. Fumbata Mkenge, Chief Justice Mkenge's brother, Mr. Mbasa Mkenge, Griffiths and Victoria Mkenge's son, Ms. Nongkululego Mkenge, Griffiths and Victoria Mkenge's daughter, justices, all the justices that are here uh, this evening, Deputy Executive Mayor of Nelson Mandela Bay, Councillor Babalwa Lobiche, representatives of different law societies and uh, uh, the bar and the side bar. I want to recognize uh, our acting judge president, uh, Judge Yanni Extien, the judge president, uh, acting judge president of the Eastern Cape, who is here with us this evening members of the university management, including 
our deputy vice chancellors. I've seen Professor Andre Kiet, uh, the executive deans of faculty and senior directors. I want to recognize especially our executive dean of the faculty of law, Dr. Lynn Bix, uh, the SRC president and all our students, the representatives of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, the leaders uh, of government, of the non-government sector, of the civil society sector, the business sector, all the friends of our university. Uh, honored guests and those that are also joining us online. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to make some opening remarks and to welcome you all to this Griffiths and Victoria Mkenge Memorial Lecture honoring the late Mlungisi Griffiths Mkenge and his wife Victoria Nonyamezelo Mkenge. I also wish to acknowledge two former deans of our Faculty of Law, Professor and now Judge Avinash Govinji, as well as Professor Vivian Lavak, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of the Western Cape. The former law deans that I'm recognizing contributed immensely to the inception and conceptualization of the Mkenge Lecture Series. They also lent their leadership to the work that steered us as the university towards investing in the law building. And they contributed also uh, to the ideas uh, to its iconic naming as the Pius Langa building of law. A few moments ago, as seen on the live stream, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo opened the new law building, which is named in honor of the late former Chief Justice Pius Langa. Chief Justice, it is an honor to be hosting you on our campus for the very first time. It is especially fitting that you are here this evening delivering the Griffiths and Victoria Mkenge lecture this evening in your capacity as our Chief Justice. And it is equally apt and appropriate uh, that you are delivering le the lecture considering your personal link and, line and lineage to the Mkenge family, having served a portion of your articles of clerkship under the late Victoria Mkenge before she was sadly assassinated. As we are all aware, uh, the late Justice Langa was appointed as the country's Chief Justice and Head of the Constitutional Court from 2005 until his retirement in 2009. To our pride, Justice Langa was also the first chancellor of our merged uh, university from 2006 to 2010. We thank immensely, immensely the Langa family for honoring our university, Nelson Mandela, by allowing us to use the late Justice Langa's name uh, to name our law building, Siabonga Kakul. Our university is the only university in the world to carry the name of former President Nelson Holitlatla Mandela. For us, this means a commitment to the great statesman's values and how we live out those values through the three missions of our university, that of learning and teaching, research and innovation, as well as engagement. Our renaming to Nelson Mandela University in 2017 was not just dropping the M of Metropolitan. It became an opportunity to reorient our university as one which give a scholarly expression to the meaning and legacy of Nelson Mandela. Since then, our university has been on a journey to reposition itself as a socially embedded university that is in the service of society. Griffiths and Victoria Mkenge devoted their lives to the pursuit of justice, freedom, and equality. Their contributions underpin the values of our constitutional democracy. They highlight the key role <coughs> that the legal profession and an independent judiciary have to play in, safeguard, in safeguarding 
our hard-won human rights and freedoms. Our university is therefore exceedingly proud to be able to mobilize their selfless work to contribute in a small way to a more humane and socially just world. First hosted by the university in 2009, this memorial lecture not only celebrates the Mkenge's bravery and gallantry and their contributions in the struggle for democracy, but it also commemorates their legacy and it serves as a permanent reminder of the vital role of the rule of law as a pillar of a stable democratic society. Our public lecture framework aims to facilitate convergence between the university and its publics, thus giving meaning to our larger purpose as a university to serve public good, to serve a cause that is larger than ourselves, and specifically for us to walk into our intention as an African university that is in service of society. As I conclude, Chief Justice Zondo, I would like again to express our university's profound appreciation to you for accepting our invitation to deliver the Griffiths and Victoria Mkenge Memorial Lecture for 2023 and to help us earlier to unveil the pious langa building of law. Your contribution to the people of this country, Chief Justice, your grounded leadership epitomizes our own institutional values of integrity, social justice, and equality. And it should be, and it is, a touchstone for courageous and principled stewardship that I would like to believe that the generations of young future leaders that go through our university every year will emulate, especially those in your field of law. We are truly honored, and me personally, I am extremely humbled to welcome you at our university, and we look forward to your lecture this evening, Chief Justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mutwa, for your inspirational words and for laying the foundation for our engagement and the lecture that will follow shortly. Our next performance, though, is by the talented voice poet, Leletu Mahambala. We welcome her and request that she join us on the stage to perform her poetry. The stage is yours. Good evening. If the day ever arrives where one person remembers that ours is a story of a struggle that once was won in three-part harmony, and artists are then invited to come and commentate on the state of our nation, I pray that the world has ears enough and is ready to hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. For I know no singer's heart that would allow for melodies to be conceived that do not lament the many rivers of blood shed by the man and woman of this land. Innocent souls persecuted, for what? 
not for fighting, but for standing for what is right and just. Not for insulting, but for reprimanding evil men who saw fit to entertain themselves by carelessly stripping away the dignity of well-respected men. Not for defaming, but for amplifying the voices of those who allowed their fear to bury their talents under the rubble and stench of oppression. I pray for all color to fade and for the paint to dry on any brush of any painter who dare fails to illustrate in his works the depth of the trauma and sorrow of little ones who to this day take a moment and stare blankly into, bl into empty spaces, failing to fathom that once upon a time they stood in audience to the brutal murder of their mother and were then labeled as orphans by the rest of the world. This is the sacrifice of other mothers, trying to ensure that us, their other kids, come to a moment where we live free to be breathing beings. If dancers were to be invited on the stage, I wish for their feet to fail to carry them forward. If their stomping and whittling does not translate to a trance that transports us to a space where we stand face to face with our heroes, if only to thank them for their unique ability to channel and connect with the divine truth and tolerate no man standing as an obstacle. Thank them for their bravery to walk tall, even when darkness opens strange doors that welcomes them to their demise. And all they had was the faith and knowledge that history would always call to mind their work and call us the fruits of their labor. Actors' bodies must freeze, meet sin if their enactment does not expose the scars carried by many on a daily. This enactment must not be put on stage if, if it does not tell us of the many bodies who endured the 48 stabbings, the hammerings on our fathers' heads, the brutal assassinations that opened the blood rivers even wider, convincing us that we must get to the Freedom House. Blood, sweat or tears, crying and screaming, crawling and bill and bleeding, screaming and shouting, knowing that by God at the Freedom Door we shall arrive. Poets must stop writing and reciting their works if all they do is showcase their verbosity and toying around with words. Every single word spoken must seek to serve and resuscitate the spirit of those whose loving arms never had an opportunity to hold their progeny. Every word uttered must carry the spirit of those who laid their bodies down so that we could stand on these stages, hold these microphones and boldly declare that we too have a voice. When poets recite, no hands must clap, no fingers must click. If that which they speak does not re-invoke the spirit of the loving God in us to remember those who walked a path we were too afraid to step on. Every word that is written must sound like a whisper calling on the spirits of our heroes to gather whenever we do. Let's call on their spirits to bless our meetings. Call on the spirit of Mandela, of Sisulu, of Tambo, of Rani, 
of Biko, of Sobukwe, of Mateke, of Matikizela, of Ngoyi. Call on the spirit of those two partners who never committed a crime but stood against the greatest crime South Africa had ever seen. Call on the spirit of Victoria Mtlaenge. The spirit of Mlungi C. Griffiths Mtlaenge. Call on their spirits. Tamakushani, Babi Zeni, Gamagama, Tetani Nestrelezo Leta, Tetani Nestrelezo Libele, Isrelezo Mboyi, Tetani Nestrelezo Changisa, Ozulu, Oskomo, Om Shayana, Amanguevu, Tetani Kuvokoteke, Tamak. Wow. Thank you, Leletu. You are immensely talented. And I must add that she's a graduate of the Faculty of Law. <laughs> Woo! which should tell us that lawyers can indeed achieve poetic justice. <laughs> Having said that, I now call on the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Law, Dr. Lynn Biggs, to say a few words and then to introduce the Chief Justice. Lynn? Program Director, Professor Jana Boerter, Vice Chancellor, Professor Sibungile Mutwa, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, the Mkenge family, the members of the Langa family, judges in attendance, the Deputy Executive Mayor, Councillor Babalwa Lobiche, representatives of the different law societies, the, the bar, the side bar, and the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, members of the university management, council members, and the DVCs present, staff and students, in, particularly, in particular, staff and students of the Faculty of Law, the executive deans, deputy deans, and senior directors, honored guests, family, and friends, all protocol observed. Thank you to Prof Motwa for the welcome this evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the Chief Justice of South Africa, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, who will be delivering the Griffiths and Victoria Mpenge Memorial Lecture this evening. Chief Justice Zondo commenced his legal degree, or career, sorry, serving part of his articles of clerkship under Victoria in her law firm in Durban. His training was cut short by her assassination. In a way, you could say that Chief Justice Zondo's association with Victoria came full circle. Now that the student has become the master, it is fitting that he deliver this lecture in memory of his mentor. Chief Justice Zondo was born in KwaZulu-Natal and matriculated from St. Mary's Seminary there. He obtained his B. Juris degree at the University of Zululand and LLB from the then University of Natal. He holds three LLM degrees, from the University of South Africa in labor law, commercial law, and patent law. He was admitted as an attorney in 1989 and practiced as a partner in Mate and Zondo Incorporated in Durban before his first appointment to the bench as an acting judge of the labor court in 1997. After a period as a judge of the then Transvaal Provincial Division of the High Court, he became judge president of the labor court and the Labour Appeal Court in 2000. He returned to the North Gauteng Division at the end of his term of office in the Labour Court in 2010. 
and the following year was appointed as an acting judge of the Constitutional Court. He became a full judge of the Constitutional Court in 2012 and was appointed Deputy Chief Justice in 2017. 2018 was the year that saw Raymond Zondo become a household name in South Africa when he was appointed by the president, of, um, president to chair the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption, and fraud in the public sector, including organs of state. Known to us all as the Zondo Commission, this four-year investigation was a watershed, history-making period for our country, which unfolded on televisions around the world. We watched with conflicting emotions, dismay, horror, despair, sometimes disbelief, and sometimes laughter too, as he presided, earning widespread respect for his calm but firm approach and seasoned leadership. Chief Justice Zondo was appointed by President Ramaphosa on the 10th of March, 2022, as the sixth Chief Justice of South Africa since the advent of democracy. Throughout his career, he has contributed to the pursuit of justice and equality in South Africa, serving, for example, in two of the committees of the Goldstone Commission, investigating political violence and intimidation in the years running up to the first democratic elections. He served on the ministerial task team that drafted a post-apartheid labor law regime for South Africa that became the Labor Relations Act 66 of 1995 and he was the first chair of the governing body of the CCMA. During his time as judge president of the Labor and Labor Appeal Courts, he contributed to developing the post-apartheid judicial system in areas including the use of official languages in our courts and how to deal with complaints of racism and sexism in the judiciary. Justice, Chief, Ju Chief Justice Sando has received numerous honors and awards for his services to the law and human rights, his leadership and his defense of our constitutional democracy, most recently an honorary doctorate in law from Rhodes University in March this year. As our country's chief jurist, I have no doubt that what he has to say on his topic, the role and significance of a strong judiciary in South Africa's constitutional democracy, will provide us with great insight and a view into the present and future of our justice system. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have the esteemed presence of Chief, Chief Justice Sondo, who will now deliver the Griffiths and Victoria Mpenge Memorial Lecture. Chief Justice Sondo, the stage is yours. Well, we look forward to your wisdom this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Program Director, Professor Joanna Botha, Chancellor of the Nelson Mandela University, Dr. Geraldine Fraser Molekedi, who is joining us uh, virtually, Chair of Council, Ambassador Nozipo Januari Badil, Vice Chancellor, Professor Smongile Mutua, the Langa family, Pumzile Gumbi, Justice Langa's daughter and eldest child. Mr. Sandy Lalanga, Justice Langa's son. Ms. Pidile Langa, Justice Langa's daughter. Ms. Tava Sheila Ndlovu, Justice Langa's niece. The Mkenge family, Dr. Fumbata Mkenge, whom I'm seeing today after many, many years. Uh, I think it's been quite a long time since uh, we last met Mr. Mbasa Mklenge, uh, Griffiths, and Victoria Mklenge's son, 
Ms. Nunkululego Mklenge, Griffiths and Victoria Mklenge's daughter, Professor Andrew Kiet, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Lynn Biggs, Executive Dean, Faculty of Law, Judge Yanni XDN, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by saying it was wonderful that I originally agreed to come and deliver this lecture thinking that it was simply going to be this lecture in honor of Griffiths and Victoria Mklenge, but was nicely surprised uh, a few days ago or last week when I was told that former Chief Justice Pius Langa would be honored as well, and I would be asked to unveil the plaque of the building. Both the Mkenge, the Mkenges, and the Langas were people that I have known for a long time, were always close, and I've known former Chief Justice's children for a long time. I was honored that I was asked to unveil the plaque. I consider it a special honor and privilege that the Nelson Mandela University invited me to deliver a lecture in honor of the late Griffiths Mlungisi Mklenge and Victoria Nunyamazelo Mklenge. A most distinguished couple that was brutally assassinated by the apartheid agents for their contributions to the dismantling of apartheid and the attainment of freedom for the majority of people of this country. I have been invited to deliver lectures in honor of this couple on other occasions in the past, but each time I'm invited to do so I feel a deep sense of honor and privilege to be asked to deliver a lecture in their honor. Maybe it is because I had the opportunity to work under Victoria Mlenge before she was assassinated and came to understand not just her, but in a way what her husband, Griffiths, held dear in his heart. I want to say a few words about my interactions with Mrs. Victoria Mklenge before I proceed. Because she is one of those women who had a lasting impact on my own life. I didn't get a chance to meet her husband, Griffiths, 
I knew of her as a well-known lawyer in Durban who represented political activists, but he was assassinated before I could meet him. By the way, one of my names, African names, is Mlungisi. So Griffiths was Griffiths Mlungis Mtlenge. One of my names is Mlungis. And more interestingly, Victoria's other name was Nonyamezelo. And one of my names is Mnyamezeli. <laughs> so my full names are Raymond Mnyamezeli Mlungisi Zondo. That's RMM. And uh, when I started doing articles under Mrs. Victoria Mklenge, she told me that when she gave me a job as an article clerk, she actually didn't have any vacancy. She said she gave me this job because I was harassing her, phoning her. <laughs> <laughs> But something else also happened which is quite interesting. When I came to her office, the name that I was using was Mlungis. That's how I was known, generally. But after a few weeks of me working in her office, she called me one day and said, from now on, you are not Mlungis. You are not Mlungis here. <laughs> you are going to be Ray. We didn't have an argument because I immediately understood where she was coming from. But the point I want to make is that since then, a lot of people just know me as Ray. They don't know Mlungis, but that is where it came from in my encounter with her. But another issue that, another matter that I want to raise when I speak about her is one of the women who have made a very a lasting impact in my life is that when she appointed me, employed me as an article clerk, she said to me, they as a law firm had a lot of labor law work, but they didn't know labor law because it was a new thing. And because I had worked at the Liquor and Source Center where they did some labor law work, he said, you must, we are going to open a labor law department in the firm. You are going to be in charge. I know you are doing articles. You don't know much. It's going to be your responsibility to make sure that you speak to people who are experienced in labor law, buy books, tell us what books to buy for you. You must know as much as possible on labor law because you will be in charge of labor law. We will be signing pleadings, don't embarrass us. <laughs> and that went a long way in instilling self-confidence in me that has lasted for the rest of my life. Because here was this very well-known lawyer who was prepared to trust me and give me such a huge responsibility in circumstances where she had really no reason to have so much confidence in me. But that helped me because I believed that I would be able to do, to, to do, run that department and to be a good labor lawyer. And of course, those who know about my background will know that I ended up being 
quite an involved labor lawyer in practice. I became a judge of the labor court. I became judge president of the labor appeal court and labor court. And I all link to the confidence that Mrs. Mkenge showed in me when really I was just an article clerk. But the confidence she showed in me made me to be determined to succeed in the area particularly that she believed I would be successful in. So <clears throat> I just want to say that she is one of those women who have really had a lasting impact on me, even though the time that I worked under her was short. It was cut short when she was assassinated. It is when we remember struggle heroes and heroines such as Griffiths and Victoria Mklenge that we should rededicate ourselves, all of us, to the service of the people and to put their interests first and not our interests and not our friends' interests, not our family members' interests, but the interests of the people. Because when you look at the lives of these great South Africans, you will see that what was uppermost in their mind was to serve the people. It was not about what was in it for them. It was about helping people. It was about helping communities. It was about advancing the struggle for the liberation of the majority in South Africa. I say this because Griffiths Mklenge was harassed by the apartheid police and security for a long time. He was detained many times. He was banned, but he always came back and continued with the struggle where he had left off. Obviously, he knew, just as many who were involved in, in the struggle knew, that being killed by the apartheid agents because of the fight against apartheid was always a possibility and sometimes a likelihood. But he was not prepared to be deterred because of his commitment to the dismantling of apartheid and the attainment of freedom by the majority in this country. And when you look at Mrs. Victoria Mklenge, obviously she knew and she saw what the apartheid police were doing to her husband. But even after her husband had been killed by the apartheid agents, She did not say, I'm stopping this now. Which if she said, many could have understood to say my family has suffered too much. But she did not. And she continued 
to represent freedom fighters and activists within the country. She continued to take part in organizations, community organizations that were fighting apartheid. And obviously, she also knew that being killed by apartheid agents was a possibility and sometimes a likelihood. But look at her courage. She was not going to be deterred. She went on. I will return to her courage and the courage of her husband, Griffiths, later on. The title I've chosen for my lecture today is The Role and Significance of a Strong Judiciary in South Africa's Constitutional Democracy. I chose this title because it seemed to me that as lawyers, both Griffiths and Victoria Mklenge would have had a particular interest in the type of judiciary that South Africa would have as a constitutional democracy. I believe that they would have wanted a South Africa with a Bill of Rights and a strong and independent judiciary. Although the title of my lecture refers to the role and significance of a strong judiciary in South Africa's constitutional democracy, I propose to deal with both the role and the significance of a strong judiciary at the same time without separating them. Because after all, the significance flows directly from the role. A brief comparison between the role of the judiciary under apartheid and the role of the judiciary in our constitutional democracy may not be out of place to start with. Under apartheid, the judiciary was made up of whites only until close to the end of apartheid, of the apartheid state when one or two black judges were appointed. Under our constitutional democracy, judges are made up of all colors in our country. Under apartheid, judges were overwhelmingly male. Under our constitutional democracy, special efforts are made to ensure that there is a fair representation of women in our judiciary. Indeed, women make up more than, more or less 46% of judges in this country. And there is still some work to be done so that their representation should be higher than that. Under apartheid, no woman was the head of a superior court. Under our constitutional democracy, the Supreme Court of Appeal is headed by a woman. And the KwaZulu Natal Division of the High Court is headed by a judge president who is a woman. The Pumalanga Division of the High Court will soon be led by a judge president who is a woman. The Limpopo Division of the High Court the land claims and the land claims court are temporarily headed by acting judges president who are women. South Africa's deputy chief justice is a woman. The judicial system under apartheid was based on a foundation of racism, whereas the foundation of our judicial system under our constitutional democracy 
are the values of human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedom, non-racialism, non-sexism, supremacy of the Constitution, the rule of law, and others. And apartheid parliament was sovereign and could make any laws it chose to make, and the courts had no power to invalidate its laws, irrespective of how irrational they were. In our constitutional democracy, there is no parliamentary sovereignty. In our constitutional democracy, it is our constitution that is supreme, unlike the position under apartheid, where the courts had no power to test the substantive validity of acts of parliament under our constitutional democracy. Section two of our constitution proclaims that the constitution is the supreme law of the republic. Law or conduct inconsistent with it is invalid and the obligations imposed on it must be fulfilled. When one looks at the role of courts, one goes back to our constitution and finds that our constitution makes it clear that the Bill of Rights applies to the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And when every judge who has been appointed is about to assume their duties as a judge, they take an oath of office. And that oath or affirmation that they take through it, they commit that they, are, they will be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. They will uphold the Constitution and they will protect all the human rights entrenched in it and will administer justice to all persons alike and administer justice without fear, favor, or prejudice. So when one talks about the role of courts and therefore the role of the judiciary, the starting point is that we're talking about a judiciary in a constitutional democracy where the Bill of Rights is fundamental, where the Constitution is supreme. And we deal with the judiciary which makes an oath that they will uphold the Constitution and protect all fundamental rights. Courts resolve disputes that are referred to them as contemplated in section 34 of the Constitution, that is disputes that can be resolved by the application of law. Courts are supposed to grant a relief to all those who show that they, their fundamental rights have been infringed, who bring their fundamental rights disputes before the courts in terms of the Constitution. When the courts deal with constitutional matters, Section 172 of the Constitution gives them wide powers in order to ensure that they give effective relief to people whose rights have been violated. And this is against the background that this country experienced serious violations of human rights for a long time. 
So when there are violations of human rights under our constitutional democracy, courts must be able to grant effective relief. Courts are required in terms of section 173 of the constitution, among others, to develop the common law and the customary law. And that is part of what they do because the customary law and the common law, in so far as it remains consistent with the constitution, is valid. And the constitution seeks to make sure that where customary law and common law fall short of the requirements of the constitution, the courts can develop them. Under our constitutional democracy, as I indicated earlier on, our courts have enormous powers, including the power to declare invalid acts of parliament, including the power to declare invalid conduct by the president, where such conduct is inconsistent with the constitution. The role of the courts includes holding to account the other branches of government when they exceed their powers because one of our values is the rule of law. But the question that arises, which links to the second part of the title of my lecture, is why do we need a strong judiciary in this country? Probably many of you here will have different reasons why we need a strong judiciary. But I look back at the period and the journey that we have traveled as a country since we attained democracy and look at what has happened and when I do that, I can't fail to see certain milestones where I see that the judiciary came in, stepped up, and stopped attempts that we're taking this country in the wrong direction. We will all remember a number of cases, including the Nkandla judgment. There are many who say that judgment made a significant contribution to stop the slide that was happening. When I look at the journey that we have traveled and I look back to the 27th of April, 1994, the day that all of us went to vote, many of us for the first time, and think of the country that I thought we would be, the joy that we all had, and look at where we are, I'm not happy. 
I am not happy. We should not be here. We should not be here. And I have, I believe seriously that many who fought for our liberation, such as Griffiths and Victoria and wherever they are, they look back and they would not be happy because we should be somewhere much better. The question that arises is, from now, to 30 years from now, because next year will be 30 years into democracy. Where, we will, where are we going to be in 30 years' time? Are we going to change the situation? Or are we going to continue to slide down? And when I think about what may happen, I think we are going to need a strong judiciary that is going to come in from time to time and say, no, this is not in accordance with the Constitution. No, this is not in accordance with the law. But I also think that we need to stop looking at a few when we talk about our country. We need to also talk about us, ourselves. What is the contribution that each and every one of us are making to changing the situation around? I chose to, spoke, to speak about the role and significance of the judiciary in South Africa's constitutional democracy because that is the area where I believe I can make my contribution as a judge by doing what I'm supposed to do properly by following my oath of office that I've taken. By making sure that when, I'm, when I believe that I'm doing the right thing, I will not be intimidated by anybody into stopping the right thing. By making sure that I will look back and think about our heroes and heroines such as Griffiths Mklenge and Victoria Mklenge. And when I'm thinking of doing something wrong, I think about what they would think after they sacrificed so much so that this country can be a better country. Some of you may be asking the question, you talk about a strong judiciary. What role can we play to make sure that the judiciary that we have is a strong judiciary? Many of you might find that you can play a very important role. You are not going to get a strong judiciary just because, just when somebody becomes a judge. A strong judiciary requires, means a judiciary that has integrity. And if somebody 
has not been somebody with integrity for many years. They are not going to change once they are judges and suddenly have integrity. It should start much earlier. And I know that in the legal practice, very often the training is there. But a strong judiciary also requires judges who do not need to be done a favor in order to get promotion, in order to be appointed as a judge. You need people who become judges because that's the choice they've made, they have integrity, they have the knowledge, they have the competence. Because as the evidence in the State Capture Commission revealed, it is easier to capture somebody who doesn't have the qualifications or the competence for the job because they rely on somebody doing them a favor to keep that job. But when you have somebody who knows that they are in that job because they deserve to be there, they have got the qualifications, they've got the experience, they're competent, it's more difficult to capture that person. And therefore, as more and more groups might wish to capture the judiciary, we must have a judiciary that is strong, that doesn't think they need to be friends with anybody in order to get promoted or to get appointed. Which is why I'm very concerned about any political parties who may be making recommendations about which judge or who should be appointed as a judge or who should be promoted in the judiciary. When they do that outside of the structure, the constitutional structure that has been put in place for the consideration of candidates for judicial posts. I, ho I wish that everybody would take the attitude that in terms of our constitution, we have a structure. Whatever, whoever, wants to take whatever position in the judiciary, that must be discussed in that structure and not attempts being made outside of the structure to influence who gets appointed to certain judicial positions. Part of what we need in order to have a strong judiciary is something that we already have in our constitution. That is the manner, the transparent manner in which judges get appointed. Everybody is able to say, I know so and so, is, it doesn't have integrity, it should not be appointed and put evidence. They get interviewed in front of the whole world. That is quite important. The system does have certain weaknesses, that's for sure, it's not perfect, but certainly 
there is transparency. But also, in terms of our constitution, once you have been appointed as a judge, you have a security of tenure which enables you to say, as long as I've done nothing wrong, but I've just been doing my job, I cannot be removed from this position. So you don't have to make decisions that favor certain people because you fear that you will be removed. And when you want to be promoted, the process goes through the same structure. But more than anything, the strong judiciary that we need must be rooted in integrity, fearlessness, and a strong commitment to always act in accordance with one's oath of office and in accordance with the Constitution, the law, and the evidence. If the judiciary plays its role the way it should do, it should do, and ensures that it does so without fear, without favor, without prejudice. It's going to make a serious contribution in helping this country to go in the right direction. But if the judiciary becomes weak, then we are going to be in trouble. As the judiciary, we appreciate the power that the people of South Africa have given us through the Constitution. We use that power with humility because we are there to serve the people. We do not think these positions we occupy are positions that makes us bosses. We see ourselves as the servants of the people of South Africa. And as long as we have that attitude, we have integrity, we are fearless, we are courageous, we are committed to doing the right thing, we are committed to keeping our oath of office, then we will, as the judiciary, have done our part. The challenge that I want to put to all of you is you must identify where you are going to play your role in making a contribution to us rebuilding this country and taking it in the right direction. Each and every one of us has a role that they can play. Mrs. Victoria Mklenge and Griffiths Mklenge were prepared to die fighting to dismantle apartheid and fighting for the liberation of the majority of this country. The question that arises is, apartheid was dismantled politically. We know that there are certain remnants of it. But choose what you are going to focus on that will, where you will make a contribution. Choose where you are going to focus on because it also doesn't help to just criticize and you do nothing. This country is our country. When we are failed, we must remember that our destiny is in our hands. Our destiny is in our hands. The judiciary 
will play its role. Go and play your role too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. I'll still wait for everybody to settle. Thank you, Chief Justice, for your moving and inspirational lecture that resonates not only with me, and I may add that I may just prescribe that lecture for Monday's human rights law class. What do you think? <laughs> I see that my predecessor is sitting in front of me. He also lectured human rights law, Judge Govanji. But not only for, it was, it was meaningful for me, but also for all of our guests. And the values so deeply cherished by Pius Langer and Griffiths and Victoria McClenge, which values are now enshrined in our Constitution. And on that note, I request the Vice Chancellor to come onto the stage and to be seated next to the Chief Justice to enable us to conclude the final part of this ceremony. I also request Professor Andre Kiert a man also rooted in human rights, I might add, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Engagement and Transformation, to deliver a vote of thanks and to conclude by handing over gifts as a symbol of our appreciation. DVC, on my left. Thanks, uh, Joe. Honored guests present here today and those who have joined us online, all protocol observed. It is indeed a great pleasure to do the vote of thanks after listening to such an engaging lecture. Thank you so much, Judge Zondo, Chief Justice Zondo. So earlier this evening, the Chief Justice opened the new Pius Langer building for this, we are particularly grateful and appreciative of the Langas for working with our university to make this a realization that is both meaningful and indicate our transformation posture through naming our spaces. Many, many thanks. The university has hosted this particular inaugural lecture in 2009 and of course, today, we are also grateful to the Nkenges for honoring our university by allowing us to use their names for this lecture, adding deeper significance to our task and remember the work that fallen heroes, known and unknown, have done to move society forward as, of course, reiterated by the lecture of Chief Justice Zondo, which exceeded all the criteria and expectations that we have as a university for public lectures. Chief Justice, thank you so much for a riveting lecture and for the preparation that has gone into it. So we thank you and your team as well for partnering with, with us. So as we conclude this impactful afternoon and evening, I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to all of you for gracing us with your presence in person and online. We are deeply grateful to Prof. Porta as the program director for setting the tone and navigating us so well tonight. A huge appreciation to the talented ensemble from arts, culture, and heritage whose patriotic rendition of the national anthem
filled us with pride, so did the poetry of Leleto. We thank our Vice Chancellor for welcome and setting the context for both this lecture and the intentionality of our naming and renaming process. And we are very grateful to the Faculty of Law for leading us in this way with both the lecture and the launching of the name of the building. So thanks, Lynn, to you and your team in working with marketing, communications and marketing in organizing these events. In closing, let us carry forward the legacy of Griffiths and Victoria and Kange, striving for a just and equitable society. Thank you all for honoring their memory. Give a round of applause to those that have been supported. Now, of course, I will need Ryan's guidance here by my side for the gift and over ceremony. Now, there are a few words in this paragraph that I struggle to pronounce. Lindy tried to assist me here with Google, of course, but that <laughs> didn't work out. But the gifts presented here this evening are ceramic pieces that have been fired in the kiln, that's one of the words, through a raku process where the clay hardens through a 24-hour firing process. Each piece, through the use of smoke, hay, sawdust, and horse hair, gives the unique patterns of the artifact. Each piece is bespoke made and offers an organic gift from the process when taken out of the kiln. These, please don't laugh, these three pieces were made by our second and third year Bachelor of Visual Arts students from the Faculty of Humanities. So a lovely round of applause to our Faculty of Humanities. <laughs> So, it gives me great pleasure to request our Vice-Chancellor to take up her position. So, let me call up the representative of the Langa family to receive the gift from the university on stage. I now call upon the Mkenge family rep to receive the gift from the university on stage. <laughs> so they're struggling to decide who must come to the stage. And I now request the Chief Justice to come forward and receive a kiss from our university. Uh, 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, this brings to a close a wonderful two sets of events, event A and event B. Thank you so much for coming, and please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, we're not finished. Two seconds. <laughs> thank you, Professor Kiert. Ladies and gentlemen, as we draw to close the Griffiths and Victoria Mkhenge Memorial Lecture for 2023, let us always remember to do our utmost to fulfill their legacy in both our deeds and words. And Chief Justice, I wrote that before your speech. So I now do declare this lecture closed. There will be photo opportunities for the families with the Vice Chancellor and the Chief Justice here. And for the rest, I would request that you please now gracefully leave the venue and join us in the foyer for tea and coffee and something to eat, uh, where we will continue this conversation and celebrate the enduring impact of Griffiths and Victoria Mkhenge. Good night. Thank you. I'm Baku Kuchle. I will not bring the photo up. Am I in the photo up? They've changed. They say we are doing the photo opportunity here. Yes, that's what I've been told. I was told to do that job. Yeah.
Yes, there you go, here he comes. This one was there. 